like by the zoo, by the gorilla cage. Holla at a nigga. Hip hop is not made up from scratch. The music and the foundation of the music of hip hop comes from records that we found in our parents' crates. You know what I mean? Old funk and soul, grooves. We've given new life to artists like James Brown and Isaac Hayes and Sly and the Family Stone and George Clinton and Parliament and Funkadelic and so many other groups because we rapping over their beats. Okay? So hip hop didn't invent anything, but hip hop reinvented everything. Man, that last quote though, for real. Yeah. <laughs> Hip hop reinvented everything. That that could not be truer. But ladies and gentlemen, Grandmaster Kaz, how how are you doing, sir? One love, one love, baby. All is well. All is well. I cannot complain. People don't listen to those. <laughs> oh, I, I feel you. I feel you. I mean, I, I took that clip from the art of rap. Do you remember doing the art of rap? Oh yeah. Oh yeah. It was like yesterday. I'm sitting in the space in the place where I recorded. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Uh, the uh, the segment for the art of rap in my very uh, uh, office right here. So that's what's up. That's yeah, what's it's up. still vivid in my mind. Yeah, yeah. I, that's one of my favorite uh, hip hop documentaries. Yeah. Um, I just I, I like to start at the beginning, man. Like, um, one thing I want to say real quick is, uh, one thing I talk about a lot is how young hip hop is. I know we just celebrated the fiftieth anniversary, but I don't think people really understand how young that is. Like, in the 70s, you know, y'all literally cr made up a genre of music out of thin air, out of what you were doing in your everyday lives. So I just want to ask you, um, how did you how did you get started in, in hip-hop? You know, what was your influences, and how did it all come together? Well, um, I grew up in the South Bronx, uh, pretty close to where most of the early hip-hop participants lived at. I I grew up with Grandmaster Flash and Mountie Mal and, and lived by Cool Herc uh, back in 73 when documented hip hop party was given. So I, I've been entrenched in the culture since its inception. Um, I, I got started by, by watching, by being a participant, by standing underneath the, the train stations, the overhead train stations, watching the graffiti um, on the trains. I was enamored by that first. And the music that I heard at home, I heard translated parties, you know, just what they call the get down part, the break part that made you dance. So I gravitated toward the dance and then making people dance and then speaking on how I'm making people dance. So I pretty much covered all the elements of the culture, you know, at its inception. It was it was a growing process, but back then, like it is now, it's basically a labor of love, man. Right, right. Um, you, you mentioned a name, uh, cool Herc. We all know the name. We all definitely know what he did, but what was he, what was he like? You knew him personally. Yeah, I, I did. And I do. Um, but right. at, at, at that time, you got to understand if cool Herc is five years older than me now, right. Um, uh, back in 1973, I was 13 and he was 18 or 19 or something like that. <laughs> so when you're that young, you're, it's a big differentiation. It was like he was grown and I was still a kid. Right. So we all looked up to him as the DJ. And when we all got involved in the culture, like he was the guy to, you know, want to be like as far as DJ, as far as, you know, uh, status and fame around the Bronx. Cool Herc was that dude. Absolutely. Now, how does it feel to see where hip hop is now from the inception to now? It's amazing. It's amazing. Um, I mean, the growth of, of, of the culture around the world, the expansion of the culture around the world. And I don't mean just the business of hip hop, the record sales and videos and all that. I'm just talking about how many people have adopted the culture of hip hop at the grassroots level. I mean, there's not a place on this planet that you can go where you won't find some semblance of hip hop. And it's right. not on the charts either. It's on people just still beating on cars and in hallways and rapping to each other. You know what I mean? And still finding records, obscure records to dance to and to and to rap to. So the culture is alive and well around the world. And, and, and it's amazing to see, like I said, how many people and other cultures have adopted the culture 
of hip hop. It's incredible. It's a beautiful thing. Peace, Cass. So yeah. I have a question. Were you able to ever attend one of Cool Herc's parties? What were one of those? What was that like? Mm. Of course. Of course. <laughs> I got receipts. Boo-boo. You say you say you was younger. You was 13 when he started. I, I want to say when he started doing the party at Set With. So I wanted to see as you came into to, to your age, what was one of those parties like? I know we read about it and we understand that he did it at a, a rec room and it was the first official, you know, hip hop party. But for you actually being there, what was that like for you? Crazy. Well, I, I got to be honest with you. I was not at that first party at that August 11th um, rec room party at um, 1520 Sedgwick Avenue. I was 13. I, I wasn't even going to parties yet. Correct. But Correct. I, I, I caught the wave of, of the excitement and the energy that was going on from the next generation. Mm-hmm. All the old, the next generation of kids, the, the teenagers, you know what I mean? The high school kids would leave the block. Whenever there was a, a cool Herc party, and, and you'd be like, "Yo, where everybody going? Where y'all going?" And it's like, "We go to cool Herc party. We go to cool Herc party." So that was something that, yeah, one day I'm gonna be able to go to. Hell Kool yeah! <laughs> so, I mean, that so was when you thing, finally but, went, yeah, because cool Herc started playing outside eventually, but he had a venue. There was a venue called the Hevalo in the Bronx, and it was on Jerome Avenue, right off of Burnside Avenue, and it was the first place that I knew of that he played indoors, um, but I couldn't get in there either. <laughs> so I used to stand outside the Hevalo and listen just to hear the music. Yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Coming out of it, and maybe I could, you know, uh, if, if one of the security guards a blink or something, I could sneak up. <laughs> and, 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 and that happened one night. It happened one night, and I'm gonna tell you, this is the night that pretty much changed. Um, my trajectory as far as hip hop is concerned. Because prior to this, I was a b boy. Mm. I used to dance uh, with the with the cats from my neighborhood. And then when I snuck in that hevelo and hid behind that speaker, <laughs> and I saw what went on in the club. And I mean, when I saw the the activity, I saw the the, the music, like how he would change the music and, and the whole mood would change, and people would just, I mean, he. It was crazy. It, it was for me. It was just a realization. It was like, yo, that's what I want to do. Okay, I don't want to be one of the hundreds of people in here dancing. I want to be the one right. person party, party rocking, making hundreds of people dance. Yep, the MC. And that's when I decided I want to be a DJ. So, being one of the originators, uh, one of the original MCs. What kind of influences did you have back then? Because you are like most people, you know, you're one of most people's influence, but it didn't, they didn't really have a history before you. Not too much. So, not like, really. yeah. Not so. really. The art of spoken word has always been prevalent um, among our people in all different forms. Right. Uh, since, since, you know, from, since Africa. But uh, the latest um, reinvention of that energy was in uh, the 60s. With uh, the, uh, Gil Scott Heron yeah, right. and the Lab Boys, and pretty much during the um, you know the, the civil rights movement, the Black Panthers uh, during the Black when the Black Panthers was out, and there was a, a lot of Black nationalism going on. Um, this is the music that kind of sparked the revolution, and these were the poets, the griots of that time. That energy spilled over into. The, uh, the the disco era, and then uh, uh, later the hip hop uh, era, and right. so those those early uh, raps that you heard from Gil Scott Heron and the Last Poets and the Watts Poets um, are a uh, rap is the reinvention of that energy. Right. Mm. Yep. Makes makes sense. Now, s- yeah. have seen the evolution of hip hop. How do you feel about all the new technology that's in the game now? Um, I, I'm with uh, the advancement of uh, of our culture, of our uh, uh, people, whether it be on the business level or financial level, or technical, or through technology. But um, I just think we we shouldn't lose the essence of whatever it is that that made this thing viable, that made you want to um, improve it through technology in the first place. Let's not let's not lose what this shit is about in the first place. Right. Okay. Because uh, I'll, give you, I'll give you a perfect example. Just the art of writing, penmanship, 
right, will be lost on the next generation. They no longer teach penmanship in schools mm. because everything is a keyboard. Everything right. is a type, a, something that you have to type. And now we're going to lose, you know, the, the ability to, to write, to, to creatively write advanced. And um, I think that's just one of the ways that um, advancement or technology help us to lose the originality was important in the first place. Right, absolutely. So I want to know where you were at when the lights went out. I think you know what I'm referring to. <laughs> uh, in 1977, yes, indeed. <laughs> I, I, I do remember. That's so crazy to me. <laughs> 1970, okay, when the whole city went dark. Yes, well, sir. Well, I had my whole sound system, and I was jamming in the park. All right? <laughs> I had a battle with a crew called the Master Plan Bunch. Um, was like DJ Smokey's old crew, guys left over from uh, after he was done, they were still DJing in the streets. So uh, we proposed a battle, and we battled in the same park where we shot the film Wild Style. <laughs> Word. Right? Yeah, yeah. And um, it, was, uh, it was hot as hell that day, and we set up side by side, and these guys got on, and they played. They did their little thing. They mostly played disco music. So I get on, I'm ready to play break beats for the B-Boys and all that. <laughs> so, boom, I throw my first joint on. It's like, uh-oh, uh-oh, it's about to go down. Now, that's just the intro to the record I'm about to bring on. When this other joint come on, it's, it's over. It's over. You're about to pack up and leave. Right. All right, so boom, I wait. My time is up. Boom, I bring the record in. It's like, din, 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 din. oh, no. <laughs> Teasing them. And then the other turntable cut off. And then the other turntable cut off. Oh, man. The amps cut off. The mixer cut off. Now, this is, I mean, if, if you were in a DJ battle, this is suicide. This is like. There's <laughs> nothing you can do there, yeah? <laughs> this is the death of you if this happens to you. But fortunately, his equipment got cut off, too. Yep. Uh, and then yeah. the street lights. Went and out. the streets started going out one by one, uh, like poof, 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 <laughs> man, poof, poof, like poofed all the way down the block until the whole block was dark. Now we stand in there in darkness, looking at each other, like what happened, and because we thought we had blown out the power because we were <laughs> to the light. Come to find the blackout of 1977, and when the people in the park understood what was going on. Oh, man. It was this bell that went out. <laughs> Back out! Hit the store! Yep, yep. Did you go and on the festivities? On every corner, the gates came down. Shoot! Uh, oh, yeah. Shoot. They knew what was going on. Wow. And everybody poured out of that park into the shopping areas. And New York City was looted for 72 hours. <laughs> yep. That's, uh-huh. that's that's just wild Did stuff. Did you pick right? up any DJ equipment while you while you were out? As, as a matter of fact, listen, watch the equipment. I'm going around the corner to the sound room. That's the place where I originally bought my first set of equipment. So I'm like, well, I should get something back out of this I mean, investment anyway. So yeah, I pulled something out, but um, it was nothing compared to what, I mean, I mean the loss that the city suffered. And yeah, it was the, like the $68 billion, million dollars or something yeah. crazy like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah 72 yeah. hours. That's why. Like I said, the new wealth right. among the people. Because <laughs> everything was for sale in that game. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's how you got it. <laughs> Cigarettes, mopeds, everything. You know, jewelry, you, good. you know what I mean? Food stamps, <laughs> everything, everything. Uh, and DJ equipment. Oh, I love it. I want, a lot of the DJs got their equipment during oh, that blackout. I'm, That's why I wanted to make sure I had, yeah. I'd asked you what that experience was like. You know, most people have, will never experience a citywide blackout. I think the Far Rockaways <laughs> were the only ones that didn't get hit as far as that that incident. Yeah, but every place that had a major shopping area, they got got. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, small business owners <laughs> suffered, for sure. <laughs> sure. I wanted to uh, I wanted to ask you what's your relationship with Flash? And, you know, you're both, you're both Grandmaster. Is that a coincidence? Is there a story behind that? Is there a relationship there? Well, well, um, our, our, we have a hip-hop relationship. Right. Uh, Grandmaster Flash and myself, 
Uh, we have a mutual, I hope it's mutual, respect <laughs> for, for, for each other. Um, uh, the Grandmaster part, uh, the first Grandmaster that I ever heard of as far as DJing is concerned was, of course, Grandmaster Flowers uh, okay. from Brooklyn, who I'm told was uh, an inspiration to Flash. And uh, Flash uh, became the first hip-hop uh, Grandmaster. Gra Grandmaster. Right. Mm, right. Uh, Flash's whole reputation back in the early days was speed, uh, being able to cut a record back and forth real fast. Yep. So um, one night, I was uh, I had a jam in, in one of my spots that I used to play in, and uh, I was on the turntable and I was cutting the record back and forth. And my my, my partner Disco Wiz, he kept urging me on. He was like, faster, faster, faster. <laughs> so I was like, eh. Eh, eh, eh. And he was right. like, faster, faster. I was like, eh, 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 <laughs> eh, eh, eh. He was like, faster, faster. I was like, eh, 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 eh. He was like, Grandmaster, Grandmaster, Grandmaster. And then the crowd started going, Grandmaster, Grandmaster, okay, okay. Grandmaster. And from that night on, I was Grandmaster. Cass. That's dope. Cass oh, I love it. That's so dope. <laughs> I got, yeah. I got, I got so, one more so, real quick one. Oh, go ahead. The name, the 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 title, um, comes from uh, Grandmaster Flash being one of the fastest DJs, and that night, I guess I I achieved that level, or uh, whatever of, of of speed uh, off of that particular uh, performance, and I was ordained Grandmaster by, you know, my partner and by the crowd, so I became Grandmaster. Yeah, yes, sir. And there's not very many of those. No, no. Mm. So it's a great, well, no, no. great and, title and to since have. Since then, there's, there's some self proclaimed, you know, grandmaster. <laughs> there's, there's grand this and there's grand right. that, and, you know, this and that. But um, grandmaster is not my name. Grandmaster is a title. Right. It's a level of excellence. Right. And I feel yeah. that I have uh, Absolutely. achieved that level of excellence on, on many a platform. And that's why I could uh, continue to use the name. That's why the name stuck. If right. I didn't feel I was a grandmaster or was a grandmaster of material, I wouldn't even claim the title. So, Absolutely. Um, I do want to ask you, uh, where were you, <clears throat> excuse me, where were you the first time you heard Rapper's Delight? And I, and I want to know how you were feeling in that moment and <laughs> what kind of chain reaction it sparked. I was in my home. <clears throat> I was in my house, and uh, Hank, Big Bank Hank of the Sugar Hill Gang, who was managing the group that I was in at the time, uh, the Mighty Force Five, and uh, he came to my house with two copies of Rapper's Delight. Oh, okay. And he was like, yo, this is the record that I was telling you about, and um, I put it on the turntable, and I listened to it, and I was like, yeah, it's cool, it's all right, <laughs> you know, I, I thought it sucked, really, to be honest. <laughs> but, you know, it, it was cool. And, and and I never thought of it in terms of it being like a real record that was going to come out and right. it was going to be on the radio and all that. Man. And it was, <laughs> wow. it was the and, record. And Hank was on as an MC. Like, how can I take that seriously? Exactly. He was the MC. Right. You know, little did I know. <laughs> but but anyway, yeah, I was like, yeah, it's cool, Hank, whatever, you know. And then when I first heard it in the street, that's when I that's when the reaction really hit me. Right. Okay, yeah. when I went outside and every car that went by and every boom box on every shoulder and and radio, I mean was playing rappers delight, I was like, Get the fuck out of here. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, it just took off like wildfire. Right. And, um, yeah, but a lot of people didn't like that that was the record oh, that yeah. pretty much stampeded hip-hop yeah, in history. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. A, a lot of people do say that, but because a lot of people miss the era of uh, of lyricism, early lyricism in hip-hop, true MCs. Like, the style that Rapper's Delight was done in, that was like the early disco style that mm. we had, you know, did earlier, like, right. mm -hmm. following in the vein of, like, DJ Hollywood and Eddie Chiba, uh, who, rest in peace, just recently passed away, and our brother Love Bus Starsky. But once we found our own voice and yeah. our own voices, there was a definitive difference between MCs and those uh, call and response disco DJs Correct. Uh, prior. And that's what Rapper's Delight sounded like. 
uh, one of the verses being my own, right. mm-hmm. uh, that's what I rap like when I, I was emulating that style in the early days. Everybody had to have a rhyme with their name in it. And when I first <laughs> heard somebody say that, it was Love Buck Starsky. And he said, I'm the L O V E, the B U G, like a butterfly, stay like a man. And I was like, oh shit, that's cool. And I was like, I'm the L O V E, the B U G. And then I was like, wait, hold up, that's his name? And they were like, yeah, that's his name. I thought he was just saying some fly shit. Right. Once I found out that was the name, I was like, uh uh-uh, uh, nah uh, now I gotta make my own shit. Up. Right. So that's when I came with, I'm the C-A-S and the O-V-A and the rest of yeah. And that's what the rhyme said. Right. So it was interesting to hear him right. say Casanova. And that was that was you. <laughs> yeah, he was so much not an MC. <laughs> he didn't even change the name. He didn't yeah. change it to anything else. <laughs> that was you. So you're still in the song. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was like a eminence right there. Exactly. Uh, ineptitude as far as uh, <laughs> microphone is concerned. He had a great voice and great energy. So, you know, he pulled it off, but he couldn't write his way out of paper bag. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, <clears throat> man uh, you performed all over the world. What is your favorite venue that you played at? That's hard to say because I haven't been overseas in over 30 years. I just recently reacquired a passport. Um, after 30 years. Mm. So I've been turning down trips um, for 30 years overseas. Wow. I mean, literally, the last time I was overseas was at Princess Diana's funeral. Wow. In London. Oh, wow. Right. Okay. Right. So, um, like I mean, hip, <laughs> right. hip hop hip hop has been everywhere since then. I mean, Dubai and places like that have opened up to hip hop and, and uh, it's bred out there, but I've had to turn down these trips for 30 years. I, I finally, like I said, acquired a passport and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to roll. <laughs> so I haven't been to my favorite venue yet. I don't, I don't think. Mm. Um, we're all, we're all out in Denver. We're all out in Denver. Have you been oh, to Denver? Right. Have you been to, have you been to Denver? Denver? Of course. Okay. My girl Christy Z is in Denver. Okay. She does the DMC. Oh, uh, okay. Mm. Uh, nice. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I've done the thing out there in Colorado. I love it out there. One of the first uh, and dopest places that they legalized weed. Right. So, of course. <laughs> That's our reputation. I got a love. love for the entire thing. Yes. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, I did the Sundance Film Festival uh, with Ice-T for the premiere of The Art of Rap uh, when that dropped. So, nice. Yeah. Very cool. Mm. Very cool. I love it out there, guys. That's France, right? Yeah. I've so, been to yeah. South Park and all that. Oh, Okay, okay. <laughs> so I want to go back to the Cold Crush Brothers. You were actually on the soundtrack for Wild Style. That's a that's a very instrumental era for hip-hop, and you were part of the Cold Crush Brothers. I want to hear how that experience kind of came along and and just some, some kind of story or some background in that. Well, I mean, after the debacle with Hank and the Sugar Hill <laughs> Gang and Rapper's Delight and everything, it was like I was at a crossroads. And um, it's like, you're going to keep trying to acquire people and, and to make a group, or you're just going to go out here and do your thing, man. And, and I kept putting my buddies down and friends around me, you know, trying to make this group thing work. And finally, my man JDL, he was like, listen, man, you, you need to stop messing with these dudes and just, let's just, me and you, let's rock out. Okay? Right. And uh, mm-hmm. I was like, all right, let's do it. So we became uh, the notorious two. And if you look at flyers during that era, we on eight out of 10 flyers of every party that that happened out there. Absolutely. (laughs) Taz and JDL, the notorious two. All right. And so that was prior to us joining the Cold Crush Brothers. Charlie Chase was uh, one of the only Puerto Rican DJs in the Bronx playing hip hop, playing break beats, scratching records. So that was like a novelty back then. So Tony Tone wanted to build a group around him. So he started recruiting different people. There was a different Cold Crush crew before I, myself, and JDL got down. But um, once he approached me about, you know, joining the group, he said, all you got to do is concentrate on the MCs. 
And I was like, all right, well, if JDL is down, I'm down. And he was like, nah, I don't want JDL. <laughs> he was like, I don't want him. He crazy. He's like, yeah, he's crazy. I'm like, yeah, but if he ain't down, I ain't down. We had, a ven- we had a venue out here called Cold Crush. It's closed now, but it was... One of, I, I, I saw it. I it was, yeah, it was one of my, in my opinion, one of the best Denver had. I wish I it was still so. around. I wish yeah, it was still absolutely. around. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, I, and I, wonder if it, I wonder if half the people that go there even know the origins of that name. You know, I know the owners did, but. <laughs> they do. They do. Because I went through there and DJ Tony Tone went through there. Oh, okay. Well. That's dope. And, and seeing it, it, I mean, it was, it's cool. It was cool. I wish it was still there. Right. Um, but yeah, basically, and that's how the group came about. Once I was, he was like, all right. Um, it, it, y'all, y'all get down, and it was me, him, JDL, me, JDL, Easy AD, and Almighty KG, and we just went to work. We went to the lab. Once we were established that we were a group and we were going to move forward with this team, then we went in the lab, which which is like my crib, my house, and every day. We practiced every day for a year, and we came out in 1981 and just took shit yeah. off. Man. <laughs> That's what's up. That's super dope. <laughs> I got one more question for you. Where do you see hip hop going? Uh, I, I I see no limit. I see no limit for hip hop. I mean, who 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 thought it would go this far? <laughs> right. Very true. You know what I mean? Right. Uh, we have quotes on records even saying that you know, who thought that hip hop would take it this far? <laughs> yeah. I'm asked. I'm asked a lot. Uh, did you ever think that hip hop would grow to the proportions that it? I wish I would say yes. <laughs> <laughs> How well, if I thought if I thought if I had an inkling that hip hop would grow to these proportions, I'd have a bigger stake in it. For sure. Okay. Absolutely. I, I would own the first hip hop everything. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. There would be some kind of governing board as far as hip hop is concerned, so not everybody could just come take it and run in any direction they wanted with it. Okay, that's a lot of things I would have done had I known hip hop would grow, or even thought that hip hop would grow to these proportions. The best thing I I could think of, wouldn't this be cool? <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, that's incredible. I think everybody felt like that back then. It was just it was what was cool for for us to do then. You know, I don't I don't think anybody I've ever asked could you have fathomed that this is where we would have ended up at in every commercial on the Super Bowl as the halftime shows, you know, just so many different things that we would have never dreamt of. Exactly. And we're the creators. We're the ones doing it. And when you're in the moment, when you're in it, you know, it's hard to look free from the outside looking in and look at alternate, you know, uh, realities and and things that may come of what you're doing because you're still doing it right now. I can't even look past writing this trying to figure out, okay, well, what audience am I going to reach with it? And what, I ain't think about all that shit. I'm trying to write it. You know, yeah, and sure. it dope. <laughs> you know the, the people who can't write like me have time to think about, well, wow, 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 if this guy writing was heard over here and over there, and that's where uh, promoters come into play. And that's where, you know, managers and agents come into play. People who see things for you that you don't have time to see yourself because you're so involved in the creative process. I'm glad you said that. I think a lot of people feel like this is something that they could do themselves and you need a whole entire team. This oh, is yeah. Yeah, yeah, to this to day. Yeah. yeah. Back then all the, that never changed. <laughs> I mean, back yeah. then, you know, they were selling the records and CDs and right. tapes out of the trunk of, of their cars. Either way, you still needed a team. And I feel like that to this day, you know, I understand that uh, the age of technology has made things a little bit easier, but at the end of the day, you still need a team. Yeah, absolutely. For sure. For sure. For sure. I mean, my, I'm not going to call it resurgence, or, uh, but uh, uh, when COVID uh, kind of lifted and we all came up out of that, I had planted so many seeds prior to it that once the veil was lifted, it, everything was on and popping. Mm, right. You know what I'm saying? I had put things into play. My creativity had spawned. I started, you know, making t-shirts during covid and 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 do and starting businesses and and aligning with people so when we came out of it it's like let's go let's get the crack it was on and popping i you know uh i got the call from ll cool j for rock the bells radio and uh 
I, I, I've been on there ever since. That was my that was my question. I was gonna come in with. Are you, no, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So you have the joint on Sirius Rock the Bells Radio. I want to know what it feels like from you know being radio bound. <laughs> 30 years ago to, to <laughs> what it feels like to doing serious. And if you're looking for a co-host, I got you. <laughs> Plug. Well, well that's, that's love. That's love, Ma. But I do have a co-host. Yes, you Her do. Her name is Sha Rock. Yes, you do. And she's the first Amazing. female MC. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. Amazing. Yes. <laughs> LL thought that that would be a great blend of Absolutely. us together, being the old, the old, the OGs. We put the old and OG, <laughs> right, on Rock, Rock yes. and Bell. Yes. Uh, so uh, he proposed a show, morning show, Monday through Friday. I was like, I'm with it. I'm with it all day, every day. Okay. He could have said, if you want to do a show with uh, Bobby Brown, and I would have been, <laughs> yeah, let's go. Let's do it. You know, it's all good. But that it was a perfect blend. And uh, like I said, we got a great chemistry, um, a great respect for each other. We uh, kind of hold that day one status together. Mm. Right. And I think that that commonality helps us on the air. And um, I, I've been enjoying it. I've been enjoying it. I always knew that I had a, a personality for radio. Uh, me being a DJ, I could do a whole radio show. I don't need an engineer. Right. And, none of that shit, you know what I mean? and I could do the whole thing. But uh, just the dynamics of just being an on-air personality, that fits me fine. All right? That fits me fine. And... Uh, I couldn't ask for a better uh, situation. Yeah, I um, think it's perfect. Somebody Rock the bells. Like right, yeah. Yep, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, um, because it's like hands-on. It's like I call them any time of the day or, or whenever, you know, and it's like, yo, what's good? What you need? You straight? This and that? Woo, woo. Yeah, any problems, you know, on the radio, whatever. They, oh, that's your show. You say what you want to say. Right. If anybody right. don't like it, I got your back. You know what I mean? <laughs> whatever. So we've got, you know, perfect, you know, freedom to just be ourselves and express ourselves on the show and, and having that platform is uh something needed like at this point in my life and in my career you know I, I don't always want to have to go, travel or, or yep. be so proud to you know to get a message across i i i, I deal with social media but it, it's such a pain in the ass <laughs> and, yeah. uh, it's become such you know like a, a business, like an entity. A job. Before, yeah, cool. a full, it's a full-time you know, it's job. A job. Yeah. Girls or whatever, or connect <laughs> with your family or whatever. You know, now it's this big, I, I don't know, you know what. So, and and, and uh, Instagram just, uh, I just got jacked off of my, my Instagram profile <laughs> where mm. I had like a hundred and almost 120,000 followers that I got like generically, like one right, by one. Right, right, By just posting contests. I don't do ads, I don't pay. Yeah, none of that. Mm -hmm. nah. and none of that shit. And I, I no longer have access to my to my Instagram page. So that kind of turned me off. Oh, that's that's why I couldn't get you to respond to me on IG. <laughs> that, makes more, that makes more be. sense. <laughs> and I, I, I'm joined the iPhone um, revolution. Okay, well. yeah. So I've been Android most of my life, and now I got a Mac computer, an iPad. There you go. Well, oh, welcome, welcome, welcome aboard. <laughs> Kaz, yeah, are you man. are you still doing the hush hip hop tours? Oh, as a matter of fact, no, I'm not. I, I okay. kind of, I okay. kind of. The things that I was doing, well, our business was the first business to go down. Mm. Terrific, right? Yeah, terrific. Sure. Sure. When, when, when COVID happened, they stopped everything as far as people tourism. gathering. Yeah, yeah. That, yeah. Was t that was rough. Tourism, they even stopped people from entering the country or leaving it at some point. Music, the uh -oh. music basically took a haul. All of music, like, that's what it was. Yeah, entertainment, right. period. Yeah, exactly. Movie theaters, plays, Broadway. Um, I had my birthday. My birthday was coming up. I had tickets and everything, a venue set up and everything. And a month before... COVID kicked in and everything right. had to shut down. So um, when I came out of it, I mean, our tours got shut down as well. But all the things, like I said, the, the, the seeds that I had planted um, during COVID and prior to started to to, to sprout um, when I came out. So uh, going back to the tours wasn't my main, uh, you know, I had other shit on the table right. by the yeah. time, you know, that came back. And of course, uh, the tours have never gotten back to where they were when it first stopped because of that two and a half year lull 
you know, and people mm. getting back to some Tourette. semblance of normalcy. Oh, yeah. yeah, we're still trying. <laughs> right. As far as tourism is concerned. So the tours are still going on, but I just got a lot more things going on um, to, to be able to do them. So uh, um, uh, my brother, the Mighty Mike C, uh, from the Fearless Four MCs, yeah. right. um, he does the hip hop tours nice. um, in my place, and as well as my man Razor, who's a young artist who uh, I groomed at Hush Tours. Uh, Reggie Reg from the Crash Crew was doing Hush Tours with us as well. So um, the business continues, but I'm just not there, you know, right. as a host mm. physically on the bus. Mm. Okay, okay. Um, well, we'll get you out of here on this. I got a two part question. Um, I like you know, I like to get your opinion on this. Uh, let's say we exclude you. Who who is uh, your goat? Who you know? Who's like the who's the MC that you if you had to say that dude's the greatest? Who would that be? And also, my, the second part is who's an MC of current like nowadays that you actually enjoy? Uh, from uh, from the inception of of rap or MCing, there's only one person I I, I looked at and was like, I got to be that good. I gotta be that good or better, and that's Melly Mel. Okay, mm, yeah, that's Melly Mel the from legend. the Furious Five. And um, since I'm from that era, and uh, I've seen everybody who came afterwards, of course. And um, so <clears throat> I've never had that uh, thought process with anyone from my era except Melly Mel. I gotta be as good as him. I gotta be, you know, comparable to that guy. Right. right there and um i guess through that you know me 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 wanting to be that good you know it inspired other people you know to uh uh emulate me you know yeah. in that sense mm -hmm. but i don't do like top five right <laughs> top 20 and, and none of that shit because too many of us do this to pigeonhole I agree. Uh, our our skill set into a few different individuals, and it's been too long. <clears throat> Some people would disagree that there might not even be fifty great MCs, oh, yeah. but I, I I I believe so. I believe that there is, and um, for you to try to say this one is better than this one, or this this goes on, or this number, I wouldn't do that to the culture. Um, Some people that I do enjoy listening to, Black Thought. Is some um, oh, yeah. I enjoy <laughs> is a, a technician um, lyrically, and anybody who can do anybody's rap, like if you can do anybody's song, you, you're a master at this shit. Mm -hmm. right. you know what I mean, and that's what I respect. I'm I can I can recite anybody lyrics to you from the beginning of hip hop all the way up till today. Right. Now, there's some people I don't listen to as much, so I don't mean each and every record or individual. But for the most part, I know everybody's shit. I could be anybody. Right. You know what I mean? So <laughs> I think that's a, that's a skill set that you put into yourself yeah. that, you know, that I can do everybody and me. Absolutely. That's hard. Anybody and <laughs> yeah, me. Yeah. That's, you know that's, a, that's, but, a, good, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, one one quick question. When I see that in him. So. One quick question uh, from the chat. The chat, someone in the chat wants to know what, just what do you think about the evolution of DJing and scratching and like where it is today? I think it's been amazing. Um, because of the technology involved in hip hop, it's become, it's become easier for the average person to become a DJ, but a turntablist, right? Two different things, okay. <laughs> it's two different things, it's two different things, and to be able to scratch and cut, beat, juggle. And, and come up with new concepts. The speed aspect is still involved very prevalently in turntablism. And um, that gets showcased at things like the DMC um, DJ battles, which happen annually around the world in different continents and things like that. And they still showcase the skill set that it takes to be an actual turntablist. And that's different from just being a DJ. And yeah. I mean, cats right. like Qbert and Apollo yeah. and Mixmaster Mike and, um, you know, um, uh, the DJs on this side, um, Rob Swift and, and these guys, Rock Raider, just revolutionized the art of turntable right. to where I think it's the one element 
that's uh, pretty much as close to the aesthetics of what it was when it started than everything else. Back when you used to have to carry your crates of records <laughs> up the stairs, yeah. there was no flash drives, no libraries, none of that. None of that. I, I, of that. I respect all the all old yeah. school DJs just for that. I uh, love it because you would have to hide all your records <laughs> right. so that people wouldn't yep. steal your yeah. mixes. And <laughs> man. Exactly, and that's part of the part of the mystique and part of the what I call receipts yeah. in right. hip hop because at some point all guys had to do was come. The table was set already. Right. Okay. But some people had to set that table. All right. And I was one of the people that had to set the table. I had to drag my equipment out of my house. First I had to acquire it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Buy it, whatever, steal it, borrow, pay, <laughs> whatever. Okay. And when everybody wanted to just yo, let's bring the set out today. And help me bring it out, but nobody helped me bring it out. <laughs> I carry it, put it away. Okay. Yeah. It's a lot of labor. <laughs> trials and tribulations of, of that aspect of it, too. I didn't just come to a party and jump on a microphone. Right. You know what I'm saying? So, like, my journey through hip hop is from grassroots. I made my own flyer. Right. By hand. I drew the flyer. There's, fly, there's flyers from Casanova Fly that are in museums right now that I hand drew. So I mean, every element of the culture, I've 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 had some kind of dalliance with, at some point. That's well, we thank amazing. you for being a pioneer, yes, and I'm yes. super grateful to have a couple of words with you today. Yeah, absolutely, yeah, absolutely. And uh, hey, I appreciate <laughs> you guys having me. It might take it might take me a couple of days to like really <laughs> kick in that we just talked to like a, a true father of this genre, but because I know everybody in this room, hip hop molded all of our lives. Yeah. So, you know, th- really thank you thank and happy you. 50th hip hop anniversary. Oh, yeah. Same to you guys, man. Uh, hip hop 50 means a little more to me, maybe than uh, some people. Um, right. The fact that I've been here for f- over 50 years and I've seen it from its inception to where it is today. And the fact that I won't be here for the next 50, okay, makes this one all the more important. So I appreciate all the, you know, participants of the culture um, and now so in media more so than ever because um, it's important that we have uh, shows like this, like your podcast and people who highlight the essence of this culture that we call hip hop. Never forget our heroes. okay? and uh, through hip hop, I think we'll live forever. Well, I, I will say with the foundation you laid, you will be here for the next 50 for the All next right. 500 <laughs> yeah <laughs> grandmaster kaz we we appreciate you being here man thank you so much uh dropping a lot of gems and we wish you well man hopefully we get you back on sometime absolutely anytime just holler all right man have a good one brother peace peace